right up to his doorstep and it wouldn't matter. Right? We did not think that Russia was aggressive. What happened here is that after the crisis broke out on February 22nd, we then decided that Russia was aggressive. We then decided that Russia was bent on creating a greater Russia. It was after the fact. And by the way, this is why President Obama and virtually all of Washington was caught with their pants down when this crisis broke out after February 22nd, because they did not see it coming. Talk a little bit about our response. We're basically doubling down. Uh, we're getting tougher and tougher with the Russians. That's our strategy. Uh, and that's exactly what you'd expect if you're going to blame them, given that we're incapable of blaming ourselves because we never do anything wrong. You all know that. All the problems in the world are caused by everybody else, never by the United States, because we're a benign hegemon. Well, if we're the good guys and they're the bad guys and they're misbehaving, they're bent on creating a greater Russia, oh my God, this is the 1930s all over again. Any sort of concession to Putin is Munich, October 1938. Can't do that. So what you do is you double down. You get tougher and tougher. Uh, then this brings us to the question of whether we can succeed or not. My argument is you're playing a losing hand. Right? And the reason you're playing a losing hand is because this is a competition between economic considerations and security considerations. The basic mindset of people in the West is that you can punish the Russians economically and they'll throw their hands up. My argument is when security considerations are at stake, when core strategic interests are at stake, and there's no question, ladies and gentlemen, in Russia's case, this is a core strategic interest, countries will suffer enormously before they throw their hands up. Right. So you can inflict a lot of pain on the Russians, and they're not going to quit. And they're not going to quit because Ukraine matters to them. And by the way, Ukraine doesn't matter to us. You understand there's nobody calling for us to fight in Ukraine. Even John McCain, who up until recently has never seen a war he didn't want to fight, <laughs> right, is not calling for using military force in Ukraine. What John McCain is saying is, not, is that Ukraine is not a vital strategic interest for the West. That's what he's saying. It is a vital strategic interest for the Russians. They've made that perfectly clear, and not just Putin. right? So in terms of the balance of resolve, it's all on their side. And I showed you that slide up there that depicted how much economic leverage the Russians have because of all that natural gas going westward. So we're playing a losing hand here. But let's assume that I'm wrong. Let's assume that we're playing a winning hand and that we are capable of backing Putin into a corner. And we're getting close to pushing him off a cliff. Is this good? You're talking about a country that's got thousands of nuclear weapons. And the only circumstance, really, under which states use nuclear weapons is when they're desperate, when they think their survival is at stake. So what you're talking about is putting Putin in a situation where he's desperate. And if you go home and Google Putin and nuclear brinksmanship, you'll be reading all the articles that come up for the next two years, right? Because he's making it clear that you're fooling around with his core strategic interests. And again, he's got thousands of nuclear weapons. So you're putting yourself in a position, right? You're putting yourself in a position where you're willing to risk a possible nuclear war over a piece of real estate, Ukraine, that is, a, that is not of vital strategic interest to the United States. Again, it's not of vital strategic interest to us. By the way, and this will be my final point on this, what's truly amazing about all of this is that we were talking about incorporating Ukraine into NATO when we have now acknowledged by not taking military action over Ukraine, that it's not a vital strategic interest. You understand that when you incorporate Ukraine into NATO, you're giving them an Article 5 guarantee, which says you'll come to their defense if they're attacked. You only give Article 5 guarantees to countries that are of vital strategic interest, like Germany during the Cold War. What were we doing? Giving an Article 5, thinking about giving an Article 5 guarantee to a country it's not a vital strategic interest. It just shows you how discombobulated American foreign policy is these days. 
And of course, the Ukraine crisis is just one of many messes that we've made. As you know, we have the Midas touch in reverse. There's nothing that we do that doesn't go south. Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Ukraine, I could go on. So the point I'm making to you is, I do not think that this is going to work. But if it does work, I'm not sure it's a good thing. Uh, I had some quotes from the New York Times that really capture what we're doing. I won't leave them up there. But they make it very clear that we're playing hardball with the Russians. This was the Times piece last year that gave a good synoptic version of the Obama administration's thinking on how to deal with this crisis. Now, what should be done? My view is we should create a neutral Ukraine, which is a buffer state between NATO and Russia. Basically, what I'm talking about is going back to the status quo ante before we got this foolish idea in our head that we could peel Ukraine away from Russia and make it part of NATO, make it part of the EU, make it more generally part of the West. We should work to create a situation where Ukraine is neutral, and it's a buffer state. Just to go back to my simple or simplistic graphic, depending on your views, right? This is how I think about European security. This is what you want. You want NATO to include France, Germany, and Poland. You want Ukraine as a buffer state. And then you want Russia on the eastern flank of that border state. And this is not what you want. You do not want a divided Ukraine where Western Ukraine is in NATO, Eastern Ukraine is in Russia, and the Russians and the Americans who hate each other at that point are eyeball to eyeball uh, on the Dnieper River. Not a good idea. How do you get to this end? Very simple. Explicitly abandon NATO expansion. By the way, NATO expansion is dead. I've talked to countless policymakers who say this. It's dead. But what we have to do is explicitly abandon it. Say it is not happening. We have to fashion an economic rescue plan for Ukraine that includes Russia, the IMF, and the EU. This, of course, is what Putin wanted to do in 2013. And the EU said no, foolishly. We want to go to great lengths to guarantee minority rights, especially language rights, in Ukraine. This gets back to those maps that I was putting up that show that this is in very important ways a civil war. And what we have to do is dampen down the conflict inside Ukraine. We have to give the people in eastern Ukraine a lot of autonomy. And we definitely have to protect minority rights. Uh, are we going to do any of this? No. And uh, I'll talk more about that in a second. Consequences, and this is my last slide. Will there be a new Cold War? No. Russia is not the Soviet Union, and as I said to you before, we have a potential peer competitor on the horizon who could be of proportions we've never seen before. The Chinese threat, once it materializes, is going to be something like we've never seen. We're going to have our hands full in Asia. Europe is not going to matter, and Russia is going to be with us. The balancing coalition against China is going to be South Korea, Japan, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, India, and Russia. The Russians will be with us. And that's another reason this whole policy is so stupid. Right? What we're effectively doing is driving the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. There's a great strategy. We need the Russians on Iran. We need the Russians on Iran. We drive the Russians closer to the Iranians. You saw where they just sold the Iranians has 300 anti-aircraft missiles. We need the Russians on Syria. We need the Russians on all sorts of issues. We don't need to have a fight with the Russians now. We don't, we're not going to have a Cold War. Will the United States still pivot to Asia? Yes. All we need is one big crisis out there. It's coming, probably in the South China Sea, sooner rather than later, if you've been reading the newspapers. Uh, and once that happens, we will focus laser-like uh, on Asia, because that's a peer competitor. Russia is not a peer competitor. What are the implications for NATO? This gets back to the previous question. I, I think that NATO is uh, in serious trouble and will disappear as a functioning alliance over time, in large part because I think we're going to pivot to Asia. Um, 
What are the implications of all this for our Asian allies? It's a very interesting question. Uh, I was in Japan in December of 2014, and the Japanese, like a lot of people in Asia, number one, wonder whether we're going to be there for them, right? Because they see us causing trouble over Ukraine. They see us picking a fight with ISIS. And they say, if the United States is fighting ISIS, dealing with the Russians over Ukraine, are they going to be able to pivot to Asia? And then furthermore, they say, even if the United States does pivot, can we trust them? If you look at how this gang operates in Washington, it does look like the gang that can't shoot straight. Do we want to depend on them? If you're Japanese and you're depending on the American security umbrella, especially the American nuclear umbrella, don't you scratch your head and say, can I rely on Washington in a crunch with the Chinese over the Senkaku or Diao Islands? Not clear. So I think this has not been good for our relations with our Asian allies. What are the implications for Iran and Syria? As I said before, remains to be seen. Uh, we need the Russians on Iran. We need the Russians on Syria. And uh, you take a stick and you poke the Russians in, your, in the eye and you continue to poke them in the eye, they're going to look for ways to retaliate. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere down the road they don't play ball with us on Iran. We don't get a deal with the Iranians. Be interesting to see what the Russians then do. See if they're interested in maintaining the sanctions regime. Uh, and Syria is a total mess, as you know, and if there's any hope of resolving that, the Russians are going to have to be involved. And again, it's going to be hard to get a lot of cooperation, given what's going on over Ukraine. Is Crimea lost to Russia for good? Uh, yep, it's gone. It's gone. What are the implications for Ukraine? And this is in many ways the most important part of my talk, and I'll just take two or three minutes, then we can go to Q&A. When I give this talk, many people in the West think that there's sort of a deep-seated immoral dimension to my position because I'm blaming the West and not Putin, who certainly has authoritarian or thuggish tendencies. So there's no question about that. But I actually think that what's going on here is that the West is leading Ukraine down the primrose path. And the end result is that Ukraine is going to get wrecked. And I believe that the policy that I'm advocating, which is neutralizing Ukraine and then building it up economically and getting it out of the competition between Russia on one side and NATO on the other side is the best thing that could happen to the Ukrainians. What we're doing is encouraging the Ukrainians to play tough with the Russians. We're encouraging the Ukrainians to think that they will ultimately become part of the West because we will ultimately defeat Putin and we will ultimately get our way. Time is on our side. And of course, the Ukrainians are playing along with this. And the Ukrainians are almost completely unwilling to compromise with the Russians and instead want to pursue a hardline policy. Well, as I said to you before, if they do that, the end result is that their country is going to be wrecked. And what we're doing is, in effect, encouraging that outcome. I think it would make much more sense for us to, neutral, to, to work to create a neutral Ukraine. It would be in our interest to bury this crisis as quickly as possible. It certainly would be in Russia's interest to do so. And most importantly, it would be in Ukraine's interest to put an end to the crisis. Thank you.